It's the Wilk Report. I'm Michael Wilk, coming to you from Cleveland, Ohio. And I'm doing my spoiler-laden review of the Orville, Blood of Patriots. Um, yeah, so this is going to be a, a, a bit of a, a a critique, because, you know, it was a good episode. Don't get me wrong. I liked it. But, you know, there were some weak spots that I felt, uh, you know, could have been done differently. Um not to really kind of make it better. Uh, as a follow-up to Identity Parts 1 and 2, uh, I, I think it was pretty adequate. Uh, you know, we're seeing uh, the beginnings of some of the uh, after effects of the uh, battle with the Kalon. Uh, and this is the first one. And it's also an episode that uh, gives some focus to Gordon Malloy, played by Scott Grimes. Uh, Malloy is usually the comic relief on the show. He's the... Uh, kind of slacker pilot who, I mean, he's, you know, great at being a pilot, not much else, uh, except for playing practical jokes and not taking stuff seriously. But, you know, in this episode, he gets to shine. And, uh, you know, I, I thought it was a pretty good bit of character development. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, go ahead and get to the review here. Let's call up the screen captures here because uh yeah we, we've got some some good ones here uh so the episode starts off yeah if it's getting a, a medal of honor like the uh, i think they call it the sapphire star uh for heroism because let's face it he kicked butt and uh you know he really was one one of the ones who were instrumental and saving everyone's bacon in, in the previous episode, so uh, you know he's you know he's getting his proper reward. But then uh, Ted Danson, uh, playing Admiral Perry, makes another appearance, and uh, you know this is an interesting thing because uh, you know, in normal chain of command, at least here on Earth in the twenty first century, uh, captains generally answer to only one admiral who's responsible for a section of the fleet and in say Star Trek the Next Generation and uh, now the Orville you know they answer to multiple ad uh, admirals well part of this is actually practical because you know actors are not always available to play the same role time and time again so yeah the guy who plays Admiral Halsey you know he's not always around and so you know they have to get a, an actor who is available, and that's just, you know, how, and then they pass it off by uh, saying it's a different command structure in the future, so, I mean, it, it's a bit of a cheat, but it's one that you can actually kind of believe, because, in, you know, in the Planetary Union, you know, they've got over 3,000 ships, as opposed to maybe a couple hundred, so, you know, you really, you, you, you're really basically, uh, you know, you're getting orders from Earth, basically. You know, none of these admirals are are out in space unless they're, like, on a special mission or something. You know, they're flying desks, not, uh, you know, so I, I'm sure, you know, if they, they, or maybe there's a rotation. I don't know. But, you know, I'm sure they come up with some BS explanation that makes sense in the, in the TV show. Or maybe they don't, you know, because, you know, hey, well, I think too hard on it. But uh, anyway, I, I'm getting distracted here so let me get on to the next screen cap which is the admiral goes ahead and uh, assigns the orville to meet a krill delegation for the signing i think it's called a lock vow or something it's, it's basically it's a precursor to uh, peace negotiations it's you know one of the krill formalities um you know, Mercer is, you know, arguing, you know, would, you know, surely there's like diplomats who are more qualified, but Perry's arguing that, uh, you know, because Mercer and the crew of the Orville have more experience dealing directly with the Krill because, you know, they, uh, Ed and Gordon infiltrated a Krill ship in season one and, uh, also Ed has experience with the Krill woman, uh, Talea who had infiltrated the Orville. So that gives him, you know, a, a unique experience in dealing with the Krill that other Union 
officers simply don't have. So, uh, you know, that's why they're assigned to do this mission, except uh, there's a bit of a problem in that the Krill are firing on one of their own shuttles as a as the Orville arrives to meet the delegation. And, uh, you know, so uh, already we're seeing some stuff go on that's kind of screwed up. So what's going on here? And this is what I like about it, is that they're setting up a mystery to be solved. And, uh, you know, so the shuttle uh, makes a crash landing in the Orville shuttle bay. Tala, you know, rips open the door... And have you noticed that there is a, a distinct tendency to have everything be designed the same in Star Trek and in the Orville? It's like, you, you know, because you've got alien species, you know, they've got different aesthetics, different ship designs, but they all seem to have a common element in all of them. In this case, you know, you know, just a, a good example, their shuttles are all like kind of like these bus-sized vehicles and they all have you know, their, their entrance in the back, whereas, like say, on Deep Space Nine, they use primarily runabouts, not shuttles, so they've got like their the side uh, doors on their things and they've got the warp nasals and they're all... I, I don't know, it's kind of like different design aesthetics. And my one critique of these shows overall is that, you know, why restrict yourself to the same design elements? For, you know, why homogenize it? Because it stands to reason that not every species is going to have the same aesthetics and, and way of doing things, you know? So why not have a species that, oh, okay, yeah, have they have their uh, spacecraft entrances on the side of the craft, or one has it in the rear, maybe one has it on the top or the bottom, you know? I mean, just, you know, kind of vary it up a little bit, you know? Don't be afraid to... You know, get creative, guys. So anyway, the uh, the occupants of the shuttle uh, are apparently a pair of humans who are uh, escapees from a Krill prison camp. There's a woman who's uh, frightened of doctors, apparently, and a guy whom Malloy recognizes as an old friend of his from his childhood who was who's uh the, the the colony they were assigned to was destroyed by the krill and uh you know everyone was, was presumed killed and it turns out uh no his friend uh his name is Orin Channing and his daughter is called Lena. Uh, they apparently survived and were sent to a Krill prison camp. The Krill, for their part, uh, demand the return of the uh, pilot, uh, in, uh, Orin Channing, and you know they, you know, I mean, yeah, they. It's a it. Basically, it devolves into this really screwed up situation early on. So, uh, you know, Mercer, you know, offers to try and get it resolved diplomatically. And while they're waiting for the uh, Krill to send a shuttle over, uh, Gordon fills Mercer in on his friend Oren and what happened. So now we're getting, uh, you know, a little bit of backstory here. And Tala <laughs> gets the uh, comedic role uh, in trying to delay the Krill delegation. Uh, you know, so that she has to find every excuse, you know, uh, of uh, boarding protocol. So she's giving them cups to pee in. And uh, also there's a really funny scene where she, you know, she's asked to get, you know, just five more minutes. Just delay them five more minutes. And uh, so she... <laughs> She ends up resorting to the rubber glove treatment. Um, yeah, and one of the things I like to, uh, when she gives up the, the cops and it's like they're sent to the P corner to, to go ahead and do it. So that, uh, yeah, so it, it's very funny. But 
Uh, I, I, I suspect that you could not have gotten away with a, a scene like this with Halston Sage. So, yeah, I, you know, I, I thought this was pretty funny, and it was a nice touch. Um, but the, uh, the the Krill, uh, basically, they they don't seem to care about the girl. They just want uh, Oren. And, uh, you know, they're basically threatening that there will be no peace uh, until the uh, the guys returned to, to face interrogation because they don't know... Because uh, they don't detect any weapons on the shuttle or on Oren or on uh, Lena. And, and the shuttle has no weapons. And the Krill are saying, look, this guy stole a shuttle and has destroyed, like, four Krill ships, you know, resulting in the loss of 1,200 personnel. Well, we know Krill ships have children on board, so, you know, they've also killed children. You know, that's the, impl uh, the implication is kind of there, because we saw in Season 1, when Ed and Gordon infiltrate the Krill vessel, they've got kids on board. Uh, kids who are, you know, basically indoctrinated into the religion and... The, the Krill military structure early on. So, but, you know, it's essentially, you know, not so dissimilar from what goes on on planetary unions because, you know, union ships also have families and children on board. Of course, they're not in, indoctrinated into the military, but, you know, you know, it's for different purposes, but it's still the same concept. You take your kids with you so that you can teach them, you know, what they need to know, you know, in space because, you know, You've got your family with you, all right? That's just some. I mean, like I said, it's the same basic concepts, but, you know, played out differently, which I thought is interesting. So, uh, you know, there's the implication, you know, along with the 1,200 Krill personnel killed on board the, the four ships, that, you know, Krill children were also killed. You know, and that's a, a pretty big crime to commit, you know? I mean, uh you know, it doesn't matter if you know it or not, you're, you're still killing kids, along with the adults. So, yeah, this is, uh, you know, but of course, uh, Ed is not really having it, because it's like, you know, he points out, I seem to recall, you know, being on board a Krill ship that was planning to wipe out an entire colony, you know, with, which, of course, had children. So, it's not like the Krill are entirely innocent, but the Krill, of course... You know, their religion teaches them they're the only ones with souls, so they don't really see it as murder, as an extermination of lower life forms. So, you know, you know it's very nuanced, there, which uh, I, I I think is pretty cool. I mean, because on, on Star Trek, y you got everything in terms of black and white and, you know, very simplistic. And, you know, I, I'm not necessarily opposed to black and white, right or wrong, uh, concepts, but right or wrong isn't always as easy to figure out as uh, it might seem. So there's, you know, if there's still right and wrong here, but it's more nuanced, it's more complicated, and that actually, to me, that, that heightens the tension because you're, you're throwing in stuff that actually makes the viewer think more, whereas if and this is something that I thought, you know, the original Star Trek show should have dealt with maybe at least in a few episodes where um, yet you're not always, uh, I mean, there, there were some hints, like, for example, uh, in the episode with the Gorn and the Metrons where Kirk is fighting the Gorn and the Gorn captain explains, you know, look, you know, you, you guys were colonizing our one of our planets we had every right to defend ourselves from a, an alien invasion and kirk is kind of forced to realize okay you know what yeah maybe you did think you were defending your yourselves you know i mean so kirk i, I mean but, but it's not quite so cut and dry when it's personal like this because you know in this instance it's a you know the the, the person yeah, the focus of the story is someone who spent the last 20 years with his uh, daughter, apparently, uh, in a cruel prison, being tortured, being abused. And, and, you know, he's lost his wife who died in the, the attack. You know, and so he, he's, you know, he's got a name and a face to the, to the victims, basically. And uh, Gordon, of course, is caught in the middle. And, you know, there's a scene where... Uh, 
you know, after Oren has been cleaned up and, uh, you know, gotten into his uniform again, uh, he and Gordon are hanging out in Gordon's quarters and they're, they're talking about, uh, stuff and it comes to, and Oren basically says, you know, look, it's a mistake to make peace with the Krill and Gordon's kind of like, are you really sure? I mean, you know, how would your wife feel about it? And Oren is, uh, not having it, you know, cause he's, you know, I mean, could, which is a natural reaction because, you know, he's, you know, he spent all this time, you know, he saw his wife die, he, you know, his, his daughter apparently has been subjected to brutal experiments, which is uh, why she's afraid of doctors, you know, at least so he says. Uh, she doesn't say anything uh, initially because, you know, he says she hasn't spoken a word in 12 years. And, you know, she, you know, the actress who plays Lena, uh, very good here. I mean, she's got that thousand yard stare, you know, locked down pretty well. I, I wonder where she gets that from because, uh, you know, she, and she just pulls it off like, you just know that, you know, there's something really creepy like, okay, is this person going to kill me in my sleep because uh, she's got that you know, there's a very scary look going to her. So I, I think that's kind of like a testament to the uh, talent of the actress here. Um, you know, Oren, for his part, he's, you know, like I said, he, he's got a lot of pent-up anger. Well, not so pent-up, actually. He, he's, you know, he, he just does not like uh, what he's been through. And, you know, he's understandably bitter. Um but, you know, he is a union officer and he's given, you know, free reign of the ship, you know, no reason to suspect him. But Tala thinks there's something off about him and he is caught, you know, snooping around with one of the storage rooms on the engineering deck. And he's like acting like he's been caught doing something he knows he shouldn't be doing. So, you know, I mean, he's basically acting suspicious and he's clearly trying to uh do something in fact even uh gordon when confronted by ed uh who's you know i mean he's got duty as captain to you know investigate this because there are things that don't make sense you know why would a how can a mere shuttle with no weapons destroy four krill capital ships and and how do you resolve this without handing the guy over? Because, you know, I mean, Admiral Perry says, you know, look, uh, you know, it's a pretty screwed up situation, but, you know, we can't, uh, you know, we can't let this guy, you know, prevent peace between the Union and the Krill because, you know, this is too important. So, you know, they're, they're working out a provisional extradition treaty uh, to try and resolve this. Uh you know, Gordon's not having it. He's accusing Ed of being jealous of uh, the friendship with uh, Oren, which goes back farther than his friendship with Ed. A and this is where I have to have my first real critique of the episode, is that we actually don't get any hint of jealousy from Ed. We don't. I mean, it it's, it's not even written in there. Maybe I I'm sure there was a scene that got cut out for, you know, uh, the sake of brevity, but I, I really think that this is one of the weak spots of the episode where the, where, you know, Gordon, you know, his reaction seems kind of unreasonable and, uh, you know, it, I'm just not quite buying it. So yeah, I think that is a legit flaw. Um, you know, later on, Gordon goes to Oren and tells him what's going on. You know, Oren's like all those, uh, paper pushing snakes or whatever um you know and then uh, you know he tries to recruit gordon into stealing a shuttle and gordon is like you know you know i can't do that what do you need a shuttle for and you know it's basically look uh, i'm gonna you know disrupt the you know i'm gonna prevent peace between the union and the krill i need you to help me and he's basically uh calling in an old debt because I guess during the attack on the colony, uh, Oren saved Gordon's life and Gordon was rescued and 
got to go on with his life, but Oren was left in the prison camp for 20 years. So, uh, you know, he's basically using the guilt trip to try and conflict Gordon and really kind of, you know, you know, test his loyalties and everything. And, uh, you know, th- this obviously is a problem for Gordon. So, you know, he's, you know, he, he's pretty much, uh, you know, having a problem with this. And later on, Lamar finds a, a quantum uh, container, plasma container, that the two of them have been stolen. Uh, you know, again, there's no, you know, there's nothing actually important missing, seemingly, but this is all part of the mystery, uh, because a, a quantum plasma container uh, is used to, you know, contain plasma, but uh, quantum plasma, uh, basically it's the equivalent of a dilithium crystal or antimatter, uh, you know, analogous to that in Star Trek. It's basically the stuff that, you know, you don't want it getting out into open air because it would explode. And so, uh, you know, you have these little containers. It kind of looks like a, you know, one of those lamps you might get at the hardware store where you take out the the guts of it and you've got the plastic shell, um, which it probably is something like that. But, uh, you know, hey, <laughs> I like how they're able to, to dress it up and uh, make it look, uh, like something real, uh, you know, which, uh, which, uh, I'll, I'll get to that point in a little bit because, uh, there's, uh, yeah, there's still no announcement of renewal for the Orville for season three, although they they've gotten their funding and I'll, I'll get to that later, but I, I want to move along here to the rest of the episode. So, uh, anyway, uh, this prompts Gordon to go to Tala and, you know, tell her what's going on. And uh, she suggests, you know, the captain really needs to be told about this. And Gorton's like, uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, you know, kind of caught here. You know, on the one hand, if I, if I tell the captain, you know, I betray my friend who saved my life. And on the other hand, if I don't, then I'm betraying the Union and my ship, and, you know, Tala's pointing out, you know, look, by telling me, you've already made your decision, and Gorton's like, yeah, I just needed to hear myself say it, and, uh, you know, again, this is kind of, uh, considering where the rest of it goes, you know, I, I really don't, uh, you know, I, I really don't think this kind of worked out, because, you know, he, uh, you know, he's shown after his meeting with Tala, you know, going to his quarters and, you know, basically saying, uh, you know, we're, on, you know, telling Orin, yeah, we're on. And, uh, there's, and it just seems to me like, why would you telegraph this as a storytelling trope? Because, uh, you know, that, you know, they're, they're going, you know, they're, they're on their way to the shuttle bay to steal the shuttle. But, you know, I mean, he's, he's basically, left it so that there's no room for doubt that yeah this is all a setup you know that you're doing a sting operation and you want to basically catch this guy in the act and of course tell us there uh to con you know basically to confront gordon and you know they they make it look good you know she you know he he stuns her and you know drops her to the ground and but you know, it, it's pretty obvious that this is all telegraphed uh, as a setup, and I I just did not really believe it. You know, they're you know because they're they're basically they're trying to find out you know what Orion is up to and how he's going to go ahead and get uh, you know basically how how he's going to disrupt the peace with the shuttle that's unarmed. Because shuttles don't have torpedoes, and you know it's like, and there's no plasma missing, only the containers, and, and this is a, a point that has to be pointed out is that he's only stolen the containers for the quantum plasma. He he hasn't actually stolen them himself. So anyway, uh, Tala goes to the guest quarters to talk to Lena and try and uh, comfort her, 
finds out uh, there's all these marks on her arm that weren't there before. And, uh, you know, then she reveals her true colors when Tala, you know, goes to, uh, you know, call for the doctor. And Tala, you know, says, uh, you know, call him back. Uh, you know, now she finally speaks. And we, we find out uh, Lena is not who she says she is. It turns out uh, she's not even really human because uh, she's bleeding yellow. You know, which is a sign that she's uh, obviously not Lena. Uh, and it turns out uh, Dr. Finn, when she shows up, uh, you know, sends for a, you know, a force field to be put up around the guest quarters and all the nitrogen to be depleted. And it turns out uh, Lena, I'm using air quotes, you know, uh, which you can't see because I'm on video, but the uh, Lena uh, is actually a, a member of a species called the Invol, who uh, have an interesting biological property is that the, uh, their blood, when exposed to nitrogen in the air, uh, becomes highly unstable and, in fact, explosive. It's basically like uh, nitroglycerin uh, when it when it's exposed to nitrogen, and so uh, it's so dangerous that. Uh, Invol restrict themselves to only planets that don't have nitrogen in their atmospheres. I mean, they can breathe it, but they can't uh, have it exposed to open air because, uh, I guess, then it becomes volatile. Uh, so, yeah, so that's how they were able to destroy the four Krill ships by taking uh, the Invol woman's blood and using that as an explosive. Because apparently one ounce of it can uh, blow up a, a a krill ship. So yeah. So uh, and then it turns out that is what is going on with the mission on the shuttle. Orin wants to make a suicide mission to blow up the krill ship so that there's no peace between them and the Union. And uh, Gordon, of course. Uh, uh, he was obviously not having it uh, from the beginning because there's a tracking device on the shuttle and, uh, you know, like I said, it was all a setup. So, uh, you know, so Oren, after a brief struggle with Gordon uh, over, because you know, Gordon has to pull a stun uh, blaster on him and uh, they, they fight over it and Gordon gets the blaster, but Oren still has the, the bomb, basically, and he sets it to start detonating <laughs> And, uh, you know, so this prompts Gordon to, you know, try and get ready to, well, first of all, he blasts the controls because first he, he uh, Oren wants to try and uh, say, look, if you're not going to pilot the ship, then I will. And then Oren blasts the controls so that uh, the ship can't be piloted. And uh, Oren's like, do you realize what you've done? And it's like, you know, because, you know, not because, you know, Orin is about to die. You know, he, you know, he, he doesn't care. I mean, he was going to go on a suicide mission anyway, but, you know, now he can't carry out his mission and sabotage a peace. And, you know, Gordon is like, dude, come on, you know, get your suit on. We're going to do a spacewalk because obviously the Orville is going to pick them up. Um, but, uh, you know, Orin's staying behind. And Gordon has to, you know, ends up having to leave his friend behind, you know, which really uh, affects him. Cause, and, and, you know, I, I just love how this scene plays out because, they're, you know, Scott Grimes, uh, uh, you know, like I said, he, he's a really awesome actor and singer. And, you know, if, if you saw Identity Part 1, you, you really got to, <laughs> you really got to watch that because his singing voice is great. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, his acting here is also really splendid because y you can see that the pain on his face where he's like, you know, he, he he's looking at his friend and realizing, uh, I, I don't know who this guy is. My friend's gone, like completely. So he, so Oren, uh, refuses to go. Gordon has to do a spacewalk and of course, uh, the, the shuttle explodes 
and uh, you know kind of throws them for a loop. And then of course uh, Gordon's rescued because you know the Orville was on its way. I really kind of like this effect actually the the whole thing it just kind of lit him up. It I, I don't know why but it kind of reminded me of some of the other movies where astronauts caught in space and gets rescued and uh, I, I just kind of like how the the effects go with this you know which uh, shouldn't work because the budget uh you know is much lower than that for std and even uh like the star wars movies which i'll you know i'll get to that in a little bit but you know the uh the lock value or however you pronounce it uh, goes off without a hitch and uh the, you know, the Krill Delicate, uh, you know, says, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, I, I really kind of have to say, I, I like this episode. Uh, but, you know, like I said, there are a couple of weak spots here that I thought uh, could have been done better. Like, for one thing, there, there wasn't any hint of... Uh, you know, there were there really wasn't any hint of conflict but you know between Gordon and Ed because they're uh, I mean it's just not there and, and you know Ed was not jealous he didn't display any jealous but he goes to Gordon and says yeah maybe I am uh, maybe I was kind of jealous of, of you being friends and Gordon's like you know you know, he's like blows it off and says, you know, dude, look, unless it's a really hot chick, you don't got to worry. I'm always going to be there. Um, but there, you know, I mean, he's, he's kind of uh, blowing it off, but at the same time, kind of setting up next week's, uh, uh, not not next week's, but uh, in a couple weeks, because uh, apparently the uh, NCAA is doing their, you know, the uh, basketball is having their, they've got their championship run uh, for March Madness going on. Uh, this week, so uh, the Orville and STD are both taking a week off, and you know, then we're going into uh, uh, two weeks from uh, last Thursday. So, but you know, I, I thought that was kind of a cheat because, again, you know, there's uh, there there's really no hint that Ed was jealous at all, and Gorton, you know, really seems to have kind of like pulled that out of his ass and they, they don't seem to have really developed it. And also, I, I think they could have made it more of a mystery as to whether Gordon would actually, you know, betray his friend, you know, maybe cut out the whole, uh, the whole thing with Tala or, or maybe, you know, have him almost tell her, but then kind of like back out of it. I don't know. I, I just thought that they could have made it seem more like, you know, a question as to whether or not Gordon would really betray the Union, because I, I thought that that you know by by having that scene with Tala, you're, you're basically telegraphing what's going to happen for the rest of the episode, which is you know no, of course Gordon isn't going to betray the Union. I mean, why would he? You know, I mean, yeah, it is his childhood friend, but it's also a friend he hasn't seen for twenty years and thought was dead. And it turns out uh, Lena was actually killed along with her mother, and the Inval woman, you know, had her own reasons for hating the Krill. But you know, she the the, the whole telegraphing of this, uh, I, I thought, kind of weakened the story a bit. So, I mean, that's just my opinion. I know, you know, maybe you've got a different one. Um, but you know, I have to say, I, I'm really liking the the character development given to Malloy here because he's he is the comic relief, you know, and it's, you know, very tempting to turn uh, Scott Grimes' character into another Frank Burns in the sense of having a, a character who's basically there uh, for the audience to pick on and laugh at and doesn't really grow or change along with everyone else. And that's actually why Larry Linville ended up leaving the show uh, in season four or five of MASH because, it, I mean, it, it, his character just wasn't going anywhere and he felt that he was just being stifled in the role and, you know, being typecast for no good reason. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, because Larry Linville actually was a very talented actor, very versatile and, you know, it, but, you know, he, he, he found himself, uh, uh, you know, kind of pigeonholed and he, and it's like actors like to have their characters grow and change and evolve. 
you know, because everyone else was on the show. And so, you know, there was that same danger here, I think, for Malloy and uh, Scott Grimes' uh, acting because, uh, you know, if you've got a character who never grows or changes or has to go through anything, you know, that gets boring pretty quickly, and that's a character that's most expendable. So I would say, you know, this was a very good episode to kind of play around with Malloy and, you know, I mean, he's still, you know, kind of like the slacker, but, you know, even the slacker has his moments. Uh, so, you know, I, I really do hope uh, that the Orville does get a season three, uh, but there's still been no word from Fox. I mean, STD has already gotten its announcement. And uh, if you read Deadline Hollywood, uh, the Orville and uh, another show called Good Trouble... Uh, have actually gotten the money because uh, uh, and it says, and this is from a, an article back in December, uh, Fox is the Orville and Freeform's Good Trouble are yet to launch their second and first season respectively. But of course, it was, like I said, back in December. And uh, of course, now we've got, uh, you know, we've got season two for the Orville uh, getting close to wrapping up actually. Um, but, uh, Seth MacFarlane's Space Dramedy was approved to receive $15.8 million for a third season, up from $14.5 million that it got for season two. And these are like uh, tax credits or tax incentives. So, uh, you know, they, they don't give these tax credits to shows that are not going to be uh, airing. And uh, let's see if I can call up a TV series finale.com and it's having trouble loading but uh but yeah they're asking you know is there going to be a season three and this is from uh telly yeah uh telly vulture uh is the byline under that um and it says is the vault orville still flying high has the orville tv show been canceled or renewed for a third season on fox the television vulture is watching for the latest cancellation and renewal news so this page is the place to track the status of the orville season three bookmark it or subscribe for the latest updates remember the television vulture is watching your shows are you yeah that's uh but yeah there yeah there still has not been an official announcement so uh i i you know, the, the season two ratings, uh, averaging 0 0.81 rating in the 18 to 49 demographic and a 38.35 million viewers compared to season one that is down by 35% and 23% respe uh, respectively. Um, but you know, I'm not quite buying that because, uh, you know, there's, uh, you, you know, there's uh, a thing that, the uh, and you can go watch uh, Midnight's Edge on uh, their speculation on the Orville because they, they did their own review for Blood of Patriots this week and uh, you know they're asking too you know look is there uh, is there something behind why there's not been any announcement one way or another and it seems to me that uh, you know Fox would be stupid not to renew the show it's you know it's doing pretty well I mean it's not uh, uh, and th they were speculating that maybe because uh, you know, people were watching football and kind of leaving their TV sets on. You know, that might have caused an artificial spike. But but here's the thing. The, the Nielsen ratings are, are not really as accurate as they used to be. I mean, 20, 30 years ago, yeah, they were still a pretty good indicator of who is watching. But now you've got people watching on network, people downloading, people uh, watching online, you know, through Hulu or, or Netflix or whatever. So, uh Nielsen is really not as reliable as it used to be. So uh, I, I don't know if you can really judge based on the Nielsen ratings alone. You have to take into effect, you know, who's watching online, who's downloading, you know, who's, uh, and, you know, aggregate all of that and try and come up with uh, something. And Nielsen doesn't seem to be really doing a good job of catching up. Um, so... Uh, but yeah, it, uh, 
Telly's take is, you know, it's too soon to judge by the ratings, but I'm sure Fox will pick up another installment because it has been approved to receive California tax incentives for a third season. Remember, entertainment aside, television is a numbers game, and the most important numbers involve money. Still, I'll keep an eye on the Nielsen's and update this page with any breaking developments. But, uh, but yeah, I, like I said, I, I personally think that uh, Fox would be stupid not to renew uh, I mean, STD is so desperate for money to to complete uh, STD that they're actually floating the idea of returning to network television because they can't get the sponsors otherwise to cough up the money. To, uh, I mean, STD season two is so over budget they they've had to that they made these little short episodes like 15 minutes long to try and sell uh, investors on fully funding the rest of the season and they can't do it so STD has had to really scale back for the rest of the season because they used up all their budget on uh, you know a handful of early episodes and they can't uh, they, they couldn't finish it without you know new sources of funding and the four short episodes failed spectacularly uh, investors just were not interested in, in in completing it, so they've had to scale back on their remaining episodes. And you know now, STD is in in the position where CBS has to ask, you know, look, uh, you know, we might have to put this on network television to reach a broader audience. But they're really doing it because they need the advertising revenue. You know, from having commercials, and you know. That's basically a tacit admission that CBS All Access is a failure because you put out one crappy show. Basically, uh, CBS All Access only really had football going for it. I mean, there there was no new content aside from STD. Well, now they're doing another Twilight Zone reboot, which, you know, again, you know, they, they've done reboots of the Twilight Zone before in, in the 80s and 90s, and they failed because uh, they didn't have Rod Serling. And Rod Serling was really the only one who... I mean, he wasn't the only one who made Twilight Zone work, but he was the creator of the show. It was his baby, and he had that level of writing and the the sense to pull in the writers who knew what they were doing, who knew science fiction, and you know were able and willing to take risks and tell stories that people wanted to hear, and also stories that people needed to hear, even if they didn't really want to. So. But, you know, that was down to, you know, the talent of Rod Serling and the people he had around him. Alex Klutzman and his merry band of screw-ups who've never written sci-fi. I mean, maybe one or two tops for an episode. But they're the exception. Whereas with the Orville, you've got actual sci-fi writers. People who understand the genre and actually care about it and want to tell a good story which is why it's doing so well on network TV and STD can't even get the viewers or the subscriptions for CBS All Access to continue <laughs> behind the paywall. They have to go back to network TV because they're so desperate for money that they have to uh, you know, go back to a format that includes commercial breaks and also limitations because, you know, no more Klingon boobs or or severed baby heads, which uh, I don't know why they thought that was a good idea. But uh, anyway, uh, let me know what you think in the comments. Uh, did you like this episode? Did you not like it? Uh, why or why not? Uh, if you like what you've heard and you want to hear more, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon to receive notifications whenever we upload new content. And if you want to support the channel, feel free to head over to our Patreon or subscribe star pages, become a donor, get the rewards listed in the sidebars, uh, because we do want to bring you more content and more diverse content to review for you, and uh, kind of give you an idea of what's hot and what's not. I, I want to do what I can to review Cobra Kai Season 2, because that's coming up. Uh, there's some anime shows that are really interesting, Rising of the Shield Hero, and... Uh, uh, Dororo, which are uh, two ongoing animes as of this recording uh, that I want to get into and uh, review for you. And we can't do that without your help. So, like I said, become donors, uh, get the rewards listed on the side columns, and uh, we'll be able to 
bring you more content. So, so Michael Wilk for the Wilk Report saying take care. Good night. I'm out of here. <laughs>